let's see, we have nine of us here. We're about half, we're half here. We'll start in about, oh, it's 10 o'clock right now. We start on time. So welcome everyone to this April uh, safety committee meeting. It's good to have everybody here. I am recording this. I'll send out uh, the minutes with an, a link to the, to the recording so you can see that if, if you need to as well. Good to see everybody. Good to see David Smith and Charles White. Good to see you two here. Uh, Let me share my screen here. And here is the agenda for today. Give me the thumbs up if you can see my screen. Awesome, it's working. Very good. Joseph Beck has, uh, will offer the prayer to open our meeting and then we will go right into a presentation from David Smith and Amber McWhorter. So, Joseph. I thought in heaven, grateful to be here this morning, grateful to gather as this committee. And we ask that I will, that I will watch over and guide our thoughts and actions as we counsel and work together uh, to think of and consider policies that are, are helpful for the entire campus and for each of us in our shops and our responsibilities and departments. We ask you know, for thy, thy blessings as we do these things this day. We're grateful for the, for the opportunity we have to meet together, grateful to be to work together on this campus. You know, thankful for the resources that we have to be here to work together in this great place. We love being here. We follow the blessings of God to put upon us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, David, would you like me to uh, make it so you can share your screen? Yeah, if you can do with Amber too. Say mm -hmm. Amber has a couple things to share as well. Or do you, awesome. Amber? Maybe. Do you have yes, I do. Okay. All right. It's, it's set up so you can both share. Okay. Mine will be pretty quick, guys, today. Like, let me show you this. So I just have like three slides I want to show you. So can you see my, my PowerPoint? You bet. Looks good. Okay, cool. So uh, just like every year, we try to talk a little bit about the 300A log. It's a log that is a summary of all of our incidents on site. And so I wanted to show you guys that and let you know kind of the rules that OSHA requires us as an employer at BYU to share that with you all. So um, here's, you see the first slide really quick. Um, employers must post their summary between the dates of February 1st and the 30th. And I put the locations right here and Amber actually manages this part of it. So um, I kind of feel bad even sharing this with you because she's the boss of it but I'm gonna share, share with you this. So there's four locations we put the 300A log. One's in the ASB outside the HR office. One is in the MTC outside of the, in their HR office. We have one at the BYU Salt Lake Center and the risk management building. And I'm gonna show you that form right here. This is, those are the four locations they're located in to notify people of our incidents and injuries on site. This is the actual report from this year. And it's signed by uh, Steve Sandberg, who's the VP or general, Council um, for the university. And it shows you some things, shows you the injuries, type, some types of injuries here. And it shows you also on the right side how many hours we do every year. And uh, David, we're, we're still seeing this first slide only. Do you need to click oh, on really? the, the second slide? Okay, can you see it better now? Yeah, yeah, now we can see it. Sorry, guys. So this kind of gives you a little bit more detail. And then this number right here, the 611310, this is our ID number for our industry. So we're under colleges and universities and professional studies. And um, with those industries, there's actually rates. And so I'm gonna show you guys really quick. Can you see this screen? Yes. Okay, this is, I took this snapshot, I stole it from a website. Okay, and uh, just to kind of show you guys what it looks like, but the, to create an incident rate, they call it a total recordable incident rate, a TRIR. Um, you basically take your recordable incidents, these are the injuries that have to be re recorded in our uh, logs and um, a lot of the, some of these injuries are also reportable injuries that if they're big enough, they're big, serious enough of injuries, times it by 200,000 and then you divide it by how many hours you worked. And so 
um, this is just an example of one, but I'll show you ours. So the lower the number, it's like in uh, like a lot of sports, like golf and stuff, the lower the number, the better. So for us, our industry average is 1.9. If we did that calculation, all the other, you know, average universities get about a 1.9. Last year, BYU is at 1.8. So we're a little bit better than above, or a little bit above average, which is good. And this year was 1.13. So it was much lower. Wow, but, great. Well, yeah, but the number, you gotta remember what happened this year, right? So with COVID and everything, um, it's hard to say where our number really would be. I would say our number, if we were in a normal year, we had all the activity on campus, we'd probably be about 1.7, 1 1.7, 1 1.8. I think we're doing, we're always seem to be doing a little bit better, which is great usually. Um, but uh, this year was kind of an anomaly. So, but our incident rate, we had a lot less people get injured last year than we did the years before. Amber, do you remember, I hate to call you on this, like right in the middle, of, but it was, it was quite a few injuries less than we had last year. Maybe, a, was it around 100 injuries less, Amber, from what you remember when you put the logs oh, together? We had, we had 260 injuries. Um, normally, we have close to 400. Quite a bit less. So, so we had a lot less than normal. So, but, but our incident rate showed, uh, that's good. We had a, more than 100 people less, less, more than 100 people not get hurt this year which is great. Um, but our instant rate will be interesting to see what happens in the coming years as we all start coming back and uh, there's more work being done on campus, you know, hands-on stuff. So anyways, thought you guys would want to know that. Do you guys have any questions about these numbers or want more information? Uh, David, now doesn't this affect our insurance rate or most businesses insurance rate? Uh, yeah, for most businesses, uh, they call it an EMR rate, experience modifier rate. And for a lot of businesses, like co contractors and stuff, they can't get bids if they have their numbers too high, like above one, which is kind of the average, which is, and, but BYU is self-insured. So the church actually pays for all of our, I think, yeah, all of our claims that come out of BYU. So when people get hurt, it's actually coming out of the church funds. Um, we, we actually don't see all those funds, uh, the expenses. So. Um, we're a little different where we're self-insured, where other industries are counting on an insurer and their premiums would go up for sure. If their EMR rate is what we call it is higher. Amber, am I right on that? You, you, Amber is certified in workers' compensation. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts you guys want me to cover with it? Awesome. So that's the 1st of February through the end of April every year posted in those locations. Yes, you they actually leave it up all year long. Oh, do you? Ah, okay. By law, it has to remain there until April 30th, but we just leave it up and then next year we post the new one. Oh. Dave, I mean, Amber's an overachiever. You gotta know this. We, we go above and beyond. Or it's because we're lazy and we don't go around and call Yeah, we don't want to pull back down. You're I think right. that's more what it is. That's probably it. <laughs> all right, I'll let you guys go. Thanks for letting me share that with y'all. You bet. So, Amber. Okay. Um, okay, we have two new trainings that we've put on um, the new BYU LMS. Um, the first one is we replaced the old hazard communication training with a new um, hazard communication training. Uh, we needed to update quite a bit from the old training to make it compliant with what OSHA requires. And uh, so this is what the new training looks like. I've gone, I've gone in here multiple times and so I'm constantly confusing the system as to what, they, uh, what it wants me to do. So you have to agree, uh, this is what it'll, it'll come up first. You watch the hazard communication training video, you complete the quiz, Download the checklist for part three, complete the in-person training and checklist with your supervisor. And then after you've completed that, then the person has to come into the training and mark um, that they have actually completed that portion with their supervisor. So you, uh, you agree to that and then you can start. So here is the, the new training. 
and a quiz that just goes with it. Here's the checklist and the checklist is also here on the right as well. So you can just download that checklist and print it off um, as the supervisor. So your employees will be taking this checklist with you, to you. You go through any type of chemicals that are in your area and you make sure that they understand what the labeling means and where to find the SDS sheets for those chemicals. That's really what that, that checklist is about. And then um, the person comes back in here and uh, they press play on this hazard communication attestation. And all it is, is it's a simple question. Did you complete the training with your supervisor? They mark yes and boom, then they have completed this training. Um, the, the actual program, it's about 17 minutes, I think. The quiz shouldn't take too long. It just depends on how long it'll take them to do the, che the checklist with their supervisor. They will not get credit for this until they have actually done part four and they shouldn't do part four until they've done part three. So that's kind of on their honor that they have actually gone through uh, the checklist with their supervisor and uh, knows where they need to be um, looking out for those labelings and the SDS sheets. Any questions on hazard communication? about this training. So Amber, did you say this replaces HASCOM part one and HASCOM part two? Those no longer exist. It's just called hazard communication now. Yes, and now we just have four parts instead of two. But it's all part of the same. It's uh, all the same training. Same training, yeah, a single training with four parts. Awesome. Yep. Okay, so there's that one. And then if we go back out, we have a new training course um, that we put together and it's called driving at BYU and it is a standalone course um, sorry let me just okay driving a BYU vehicle so it's a standalone course or if you're going to do van driving or the CMV program you'll watch it for that one as well but we we designed this so you only watch it once so if you need to do both CMV and van driving, it'll show it as a requirement, but if you've already watched it for one, it'll blank it out for the other, so you don't have to rewatch it. This video is, um, I think we, we broke it out into three parts, just because it was so lengthy. Um, so we have part one, two, and three, and it will take about 40 minutes to complete. This goes through everything an employee needs to know about having a BYU vehicle, renting a BYU vehicle, using a BYU vehicle. It goes through the service station. It goes through the car wash. It goes through the gas station. It goes through driving on campus sidewalks. Um, it, it goes through backing up. Um, so it, it just it talks about what to do if the car breaks down, what to do in the case of an accident how to work with the insurance, why you have to have insurance. Um, so it just, it's a very thorough, comprehensive training on if you get in a BYU vehicle of any kind, we want everyone on campus to watch this training. Um, whether they've been here for 20 years or they are brand new, it will just help them learn everything they need to know about this training. And so you can also see that it's part of the CMV training program and the van driving training program. So in the past, with the van driving training program, there were three modules, um, basic driving, driving on campus sidewalks, and van driving. Now you'll only see two modules, which is driving a BYU vehicle and van driving, because everything that was on driving on campus sidewalks and basic driving is now incorporated into this training as well. Same thing for the CMB um, training program that one used to be four modules that you had to watch it's now down to three one is the driving a BYU vehicle and then it's the CMV program responsibilities and truck driving so those are the three modules that you watched um, we did this to hopefully provide some consistency as well as to educate everyone about driving BYU vehicles, but to reduce the redundancy. There was a lot of redundancy if you were in both programs. And so we, we did this to help reduce the redundancy. I know that there are some departments, including physical facilities that would like you to still take the driving on campus sidewalks training. And we left that as a standalone training. So you do see it here. 
whoops, driving on campus sidewalks, it is there. Um, so if you do need to watch just that one portion, that's the same training that, that it has been a year ago or two years ago, whenever we updated it. Um, but if you're gonna be in watching the other one, it goes through driving on campus sidewalks. Any questions, concerns? I have a comment. I have personally taken this new, these three new modules in this new training and they are excellent. They are very good. My question is uh, for CMV driving and campus uh, and uh, van driving, I think they need to repeat that training every other year. Is that correct? Uh, for van driving, it's every four years. For CMV, it's every two. For those repeat trainings, do they just take the CMV course or do they need to take the entire program again? They take the entire program again. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we changed the CMV because it used to be four years. We changed it to two years because every two years the employee is supposed to go back and get a DOT medical card. And we found out that employees weren't doing that before we started tracking everything. And by making the CMV program an every two year training, it gives them the reminder to go get their DOT medical card renewed. Now we do know that there's some instances where the employee for whatever reason is only given like a six month or a year or an 18 month, but in general, most employees get a two year card. Any other questions? Okay, we're still having a bit of problem with the van driving certification card printing out properly. So if you do take the van driving certification and the card doesn't print out, A, please let me know, and B, you can go to risk management and get a physical card. Um, the, the student employees at the front desk can fill it out. We, it works for some people and it doesn't work for others and we don't know why. We're still trying to <laughs> figure that one out, but we do need to know if it's not working. And then the CMV program certification card, you'll get that from David. Or the person who does your... Um, or the person who does your test. The one who does your practical will normally give it to you. Yeah. Unless you have a CDL. If you have a CDL, you do not have to do the practical. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Very good. Let's uh, share my screen again. Okay, we are to uh, the number two on the agenda here. The, uh, two or three weeks ago, BYU Wellness Office held a, their annual wellness conference. And it was, uh, it was a, a full day or two, I believe, of, of workshops. And I, I've been to these before. I, I didn't have time to actually attend this one live, but in a newsletter after it had ended, they sent links to all of the presentations. I'm gonna show you what that looked like. Um, this is what the, the newsletter was back on March 29th that the newsletter was sent out. Some of you may already be signed up to receive this newsletter periodically from BYU Wellness. But in this edition, if you scroll down, it had the conference follow-up with links for each of the sessions. And so the next week, I took a, a minute and went through these trainings. I had a little bit more time after that. And uh, I was very impressed with this top one called Physical and Spiritual Wellbeing by Walter Five. He's from Religious Education. It's about a 45 minute presentation and the video recording link is right there. It was life-changing, his presentation. It was very, very good. And I, I recommend highly, if you have time, to watch that. I went through the others, which were okay. There was a cooking demonstration and things like that. But then there was one down here, the second to the last one, called Physical Fitness by Ron Hager. He's from a professor of exercise science. And his is about 45 minutes also, and there's a video recording link for that. And that has got to be the best training on exercise. And uh, it's, not, 
it's not an exercise video, but it talks about the theory and, and, uh, and recommendations for exercise. And that's got to be the best video on exercise I have ever seen. It, it was another life-changing type of video. So I'm going to email this to each of you on the committee so that you can, uh, you'll have these links. And if you want, I recommend it, if you want, you can uh, take a look at some of these. And, and once again, those two, the Walter Fife and the Ron Hager, I recommend highly. You wouldn't, it would not be, it would be a good use of your time. So that's my little spiel on the annual BYU Wellness Conference. Number three, <clears throat> BYU requires that there be a, an evacuation drill regularly in all the buildings on campus. And they have a, a written protocol for how these should happen. Now, most of us on this committee work out of the Brewster building and we've been holding those yearly uh, for, for many, many years. We're gonna have to tweak a little bit the way we do that. And I have the link here on the agenda that takes us to the risk management website where the, the procedures are listed. So I'm gonna just follow that link and you can see here, it lists that there are some buildings on campus that require quarterly fire drills or evacuation drills. And those are the high, the very high use areas, um, the Cannon Center where there are a lot of people and, and the Wilkinson Center and, um, and so forth. Then there are other areas that they also need to do them four times a year, but it needs to be within the first 10 days of the semester. And those are the major housing buildings on, on campus. And then it lists the buildings where an annual evacuation needs to, needs to happen, uh, practice. And you can see the Brewster building is one of those. Now, David and uh, Amber, I did not see the facility, the physical facilities north building on this list. I know that in the past they've been there. The, the name of the building has changed. It used to be AXMB, but I don't see that on here either. So maybe we need to add that to the list because some of the people from our committee here work out of that building and, and they're probably wondering about that. Yeah, we'll talk to um, Tammy and Andrew about that. Awesome, awesome. Then it gives instructions on how these drills should take place. You decide on the date and time of the drill. And then this is something we haven't been doing. The drills shall be conducted at different times of the day from year to year. And when quarterly drills are required from quarter to quarter. So we're gonna have to this year, do it at a different time of the day. It doesn't say a different day of the week, but a different time of the day. So we will we'll do something a little bit different this year. And then uh, you contact the electrical, electric shop to schedule the drill. And then the fire marshal also needs to be informed of the upcoming drill. And then we need to assign members of our staff that work in the building to be evaluators. And we need to station them at each exit. Now, in the past, we've had the shop foreman or the shop supervisor kind of monitor how's, it, how's it gone with the shop, but we haven't had anyone posted at the exits. And so we'll, we'll make a little adjustment there to fulfill that requirement this year. And then it's, it's supposed to be uh, not a surprise. We need to schedule it in advance and put up notifications, which we have been doing. And then we reconfirm with the electrical shop on that morning of the drill so they can make sure that it happens. And then we print out a report. And the report link is just at the top of this page. You click on that and it shows you what is required for this report. It's loading here and you just fill out those items and you submit it and it goes to the fire marshal and that way he can monitor how these drills are, are taking place. And uh, there are other information, there's other information about how the drills should happen. Now, this year, we, we've been doing these in the Brewster building on Fridays, I think right before the lunch hours when we've been doing it in the past. So maybe we'll do it on a, a Friday this year, uh, right before the end of the day or something to, to kind of mix it up a little bit. Are there any questions about this from anyone on the committee? All right, I thought it would be good to make sure everyone was aware of the protocol for these drills and that they are actually required and, uh, and that we will be doing that. 
Let's get back to the agenda. All right, that's actually takes us to the end of our uh, agenda items. We now want to just review our concerns log that we still are tracking. The first one is the vehicle speed issue over in the material handling area. Now, there's been a lot of work done on this over the last, since the last meeting. So let me share some of what has been happening. Amber, let me see here. Um, well, that's a different yes. uh, I actually, on this one, I, I checked with the person in, um, in the electrical engineer in physical facilities who was putting together the cost estimate for that vehicle speed sign. And I, I talked to him yesterday, so I'd have a report for this meeting. He said that he's still waiting for some information from the vendor. And so I apologize that it's taking so long to get that. That's a piece of information we have before we can, we have to have before we can move forward with that. So that's still in process. Uh, B is Amber, uh, the vehicle ergonomics Y train course. Can you give us a little update on, on where we stand with that? In, in yeah, so we should be putting that together probably after finals. <laughs> We're uh, there. The students are get, going through finals soon, and as soon as finals are over, that'll free up their time a little bit more to get together. So we can probably, um, by the end of April, we'll have that up and running. Awesome. I want to suggest or recommend, if, if I haven't already done this, that maybe Andy Manning could be a good contact person to help mm -hmm. with uh, that. Have I already mentioned that? He's on our committee. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes, thank you. C is the criteria values safety statement that we are uh, we put together and wanted to run up the flagpole to see if how that would work. I, and I believe David and you and Amber were going to present that to HR in some sort of a meeting. How, how'd that go? Yeah, we did. And we met with the director of HR and uh, we met with some other HR representatives as well and chatted about it in other times. Um, these in this is kind of the final kind of thing we got from them was is that um, they just recently I guess changed the criteria stuff uh, in their website and some of the other things they've done and um, they said that they at this time they won't be able to change it but they did take what you guys put together and they said we next time we do a review in the coming like next year or so they said that they're going to take your guys' recommendations and look at it further and see if it's something they can implement it in, in some way into criteria. But right now, they, they said they won't be putting it in right away. So I just want to give you guys a heads up on that. But they did like it, and they thought it was really, really good. So they liked it, but they're not willing to do anything because they just did it. They just don't want to do more work. Because that's the way I hear it. Well, I think for their approval process to pull it all together is, is pretty time consuming. So it sounds like they, it's a pretty lengthy process and they won't be able to implement it this year, but they said they wanna, they wanna look at it in the future. So they, they, they did like what you guys put together. So it was, and I think you guys did a great job putting it together. It's awesome. Okay. I would love to see it in the future. I think we'll just have to check back up with them in a year or so and see if, and just keep, keep on it, see if they'll so, put it in at some point. So how often do they review that? Is it Sounds like it's review? not often, like every couple of years. Uh, it's not It's not something they do all the time from what <laughs> I got. Amber, did you get any other thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, so like it, it sounds like they're redoing the entire Sarah award system. And because they're redoing it, it's right now up for review. And they said they could not add on an additional change to that. So that we, so we need to wait until they have the review completed and change and, and their changes um, implemented. And then they can take your suggestion up for review as well. So yes, it's going to be a year or so out before they can do that because they're just revamping the entire award system. So I don't understand if they're revamping it, why can't they add something? I don't understand this because to me, it's like, throw it in. There's one more thing, it might take a titch longer, but why not? Yeah, um, I, that, that's just how they are processing things. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> we, and as you guys know, we don't have control of that, but 
but right. we did tell them to please notify us. And this is one thing we did in the end of the meeting we had with them. We said, well, if anything, could you guys just notify us when their safety awards come in and, and would they be considered? And they, and they said, for sure. They actually really like the idea that safety things are being submitted and, and that they could put those as values. So, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. But is that something is that David Boca, is that not something that we can just do as a safety, you know, just the facilities part of the safety committees, you know, instead of having the campus wide open up to administration and staff of, you know, ASB and all the other departments, is that something that we can just keep to ourselves, you know, exclusively just to the physical maintenance or physical facilities group? Uh, yeah, well, in fact, this next item, uh, safety award options, maybe we can kind of uh, use that statement in conjunction with special safety awards that we give just in physical facilities in for the time being. I also have another suggestion uh, in, in any organization, there's a lot of bureaucracy and, and things don't move as fast as you'd like them to move. And I mean, I'm not saying that just because I'm from Mississippi that we're trying to, you know, try to just to succeed one time from the union, but, you know, I'm just saying safety is important, is, is, is a primary um, of importance to us because we're having to deal with it every day with equipment and on the construction, you know, these construction jobs in traffic and especially, you know, heavy equipment and other folks that are behind a cubicle or, a, you know, in, a, in an office setting don't have the hazards as we do. I was just thinking maybe if they don't want to, you know, update this, if they don't meet but every two to four years, why can't we just do it preemptively just on our group? Um. I, I, the, the criteria of values is actually not owned by us. It's, it's a program that they've put together. So it would be hard for us to actually update the criteria of values, but we can certainly promote safety and, and use that little statement in, in our promotion of safety, even when we talk about criteria, criteria values. And so let's do that. Let's, uh, let's make it a point to do that. Whenever we give out an award, let's, let's uh, promote that statement of safety that we put together in conjunction with it. In addition to that, I suggest that um, in about a year and a half, maybe towards the end of 2022, I will put this as a stickler in my a tickler in my file, and we will we will direct this recommendation. That way, there won't be the possibility of it falling between the cracks by HR if they have if they have. A, a, change in, in employees there. And so a lot of things can fall between the cracks over time. And so I will make sure that it will not fall between the cracks. I will resurrect it with, with uh, HR and risk management towards the end of 2022. Does everybody feel okay about that strategy? Yes. Thumbs up. All right. The sooner the better. Uh, hey, Dave, there's also... There's also the the monies that we pull from our funds from that from our budget also do safety awards too. So and that's a new thing we just put together about a year ago. So we do have some control on some of the things that you know from the the university safety committee does have some control on some awards, but it, they're not Sarah awards, but they're but but it's something you know it's what we have control of. It's just you know we do have that as well. And that's a great lead into this next. Uh item on the concern log, the safety awards option. Now, Amber did research and uh, sent me a, an email. I have it up here on the screen for everyone to take a look at. Uh, she says, uh, dug up some emails regarding the awards and there's some information, uh, turn off. information about the non-cash items from Preston Black at Regulatory Accounting, a prize such as a jacket or apparel or plaque that is $50 or less is non-taxable. And so uh, there's not that hoop to jump through. We are able to just uh, award those. And a, re a recognition lunch is in that same category. So um, the challenge is to find uh, a way to uh, find something decent that's under $50 and then transfer 
the money to our account from risk management uh, to, to use that. Uh, what if you had a $49 gift certificate? <laughs> No, it can't, it can't be a gift certificate because that's like cash. It has to be a physical, tangible item that's not cash or like cash. Non-cash item is what it's called. Yeah, yeah. No, no gift certificates, no cash. So uh, Corey uh, did a little research and he found out that, um, see, he says, this is his email right here. There are some options for hats. I suggest picking up a couple of designs rather than having so many choices. They run about, the hats are about eight to $12. And uh, here is a link that he sent that shows some, some hat options. They're pretty stylish looking hats as soon as they come up on my screen here. Yeah, you put a little logo on here. You, you could say something like uh, physical facility safety is number one or something like that. And uh, that would be, well within our budget to do things like that. And that's more visible, like you were, you were mentioning, uh, Corey, people would see that and ask about it and, and it would kind of spark uh, a conversation on safety uh, a little bit easier than a key ring or just a cash prize. So we have that. also, Corey showed us, oh, let me see, let's get this out of the way. Um, in his email, so we looked at some jackets. Yes, here's the jacket right here. Oh, it's kind of, you can see that blue jacket. That What was that, Corey? That was about $48. $48? Yeah, and, and that's with any emblem we want to put on there. <clears throat> I would suggest we could get some kind of consensus on what we want as an emblem. I know, um, a few years ago, we had a little contest with everybody to design an emblem. I don't know if you want to do something like that, or if there is an emblem we can already use. I don't know. So I, I'd also be careful because BYU is very careful about what they permit to put on as far as a logo. And so you would want to check with the licensing department to, to see what, what they would permit you putting on any type of apparel. Michael. Oh. Michael has all that information too. So oh, and Michael's where you got this information from, right? At the log? He has a, a sheet that comes from the, whoever it is that decides what we can do and what we can't. And so he, we can talk to him and find out what, what's available, what's not. Awesome. So how about if we handle it this way? <clears throat> now the way to initiate an award right now is to write a little paragraph or two about why the reward is, is uh, deserved and then email that to risk management or me and I'll get it on to Amber and, and David and then it's reviewed in our, our meeting. Uh, we have a safety uh, uh, campus safety committee meeting where we review it and vote on, on the, the award being issued. And once that has been approved then by that committee, then we can uh, decide on if you want to be a, a non-cash award. They, I think it's, we have $50 to work with for those awards. If you want to be a non-cash award, like a jacket or a couple hats or a, a lunch, then we can, we can handle it at that point individually with the, the people who are making the, the award nominations. What do you think about that idea? Amber, would that work? Yep. Um, I just need to check with our budgeting people how we trans how we do the journal entry. Um, mm -hmm. So then that way we would just then move money over into your account and then you can take that money and and spend it on the apparel. Now this is not a really simple thing. It requires a little bit of effort on the part of the nominator and, and us in order to make it work. But I think it's worth the effort to do something like this. It's not a not a matter of just having a whole bunch of hats you can hand out willy-nilly. You need to kind of think it through and go through the process and, and write up the little paragraph nomination. And I, but I, I don't think that's too much to ask. I, I don't think so either. I think it's a, it puts safety in a, another level, makes it more important. Awesome. Any other comments about this? All right, I will um, 
will proceed this way. And the way this once again is triggered is an email needs to be created with as a nomination for whoever you want to nominate. And you can send it to me or to Amber or to David or did you have a risk management uh, address? So that's it's, correct? Yep, it's just safety at byu.edu. And that goes to both me and David. Well, Dave, Dave Smith, yeah. We're the only two that get that email. Awesome, thank you so much. I really like this idea. Appreciate you bringing it up, Corey and Amber and David, thank you for funding it. I, we really appreciate that. All right, back to the agenda. Here we go. Okay, we've reached the end of the concerns that we're tracking, the safety concerns. Are there any new ones we want to get on this uh, tracking list and start to uh, identify from anyone? That sounds like a big no to me. You can can uh, email me or call me individually if, if that's better for you as well. And we'll, we'll address any of those concerns. Thank you so much for participating. I guess, let's see, it's a 1041. So we're right on schedule in about 15, 20 minutes. The, uh, the last devotional of the year will happen. I think it's the Unforum and it's broadcast. So enjoy that. And thanks again for participating and we'll, we'll all talk to you later. Thank you. Bye now.